While Sega hasn't been around as long as Nintendo has, they are still one of the oldest companies in the video game field. Of the two console giants, Sega has always seemed to be the more western oriented of the two, and they have had more success outside of Japan, in places like the Americas and Europe. Perhaps this is not surprising since Sega was founded not in Japan, but in the United States, in Hawaii in 1940, by Martin Bromley as Standard Games, providing amusement scenes for U.S. soldiers. In 1951, reportedly due to governmental restrictions, Standard Games moved to Japan, changing its name to Service Games, and flourished primarily as a distributor of jukeboxes, slot machines, pinball machines, and so on eventually merging into a Japanese company called Nihon Garaku Busan. Meanwhile, Brooklyn-born businessman David Rosen had become quite successful importing arcade machines into Japan with his company, Rosen Enterprises. In 1964, Service Games and Rosen Enterprises merged, with Rosen becoming the CEO. Rosen remained as head of Sega until 1983, when he became the CEO of Sega of America. In the 1960s, the newly reorganized Sega began manufacturing arcade games themselves, with their first big hit being Periscope in 1966. Having become quite successful, Sega ended up being purchased by the American media conglomerate Gulf and Western, who were also the owners of Paramount Pictures. Up until the mid-1970s, Sega continued to make the kind of mechanical arcade games that were quite popular in both the West and Japan, but had also begun manufacturing Pong clones and later on in the decade started producing Space Invader clones. As the video game market exploded, Sega continued to produce more games and introduced the now familiar Sega logo. By the early 80s, Sega had several huge arcade hits under their belt, such as Frogger and Zaxxon, one of the first isometric perspective games. Throughout the decade, Sega continued to produce innovative new titles and made a big impression on arcade gamers with their pioneering 3D effects in games such as Hang On, Outrun, and Space Harrier. Sega games often stood out in the arcade with their impressive cabinets. Many of Sega's big games were designed by leading designer Yu Suzuki, who might be considered sort of Sega's answer to Shigeru Miyamoto. Even as Sega positioned itself to be one of the leading Japanese arcade game manufacturers, they began looking at the home market. In 1981, during the height of video game mania, Sega released its first home console, the SG-1000 in Japan, followed by very limited releases in Europe and elsewhere. The SG-1000 was contemporary with the Atari 2600 and the Intellivision, but was quite powerful for its time. A decent selection of games were released for the system, including a port of Sega arcade titles such as Zaxxon, arcade ports from other companies such as Elevator Action and Bomb Jack, computer games such as Load Runner, sports games, and even a port of the early Japanese RPG Black Onyx. In 1983, Sega began releasing console games in the US for the 2600 and the Intellivision. Unfortunately, the US market collapsed around this time. By 1985, Nintendo's Famicom had become very successful in Japan and would soon be released in the US. The SG-1000, while only 4 years old, seemed a little old-fashioned, so Sega greatly improved on the system's hardware and released the Sega SG-1000 Mark III on October 25, 1985. The Mark III was completely compatible with the old SG-1000 and SG-1000 Mark II games, but the capabilities of the system were far beyond anything seen in the home console market at this time. As a comparison, the Mark III had 16 kilobytes of video RAM and could display 32 colors on screen at once, whereas the Famicom had only 2 kilobytes of video RAM, some additional sprite RAM, and could display 16 colors at once, in addition to having a slower CPU. Additionally, Nintendo wasted no time getting the Mark III onto the US market, hitting the shelves in June 1986, shortly after the NES had become available nationally. In the US, the system was dramatically redesigned and renamed the Sega Master System. Eventually, the Mark III would be renamed the Master System in Japan as well. Despite the system's technical superiority, the Master System never really took off in the US either. Numerous theories have been floated as to why this is. Maybe it was a lack of good games? Or the fact that third-party publishers were prevented by Nintendo from putting games out for the Master System? 
Maybe it was the horrible box art and generally bad marketing by Tonka, the system's U.S. distributor. For whatever reason, the Master System is considered a failure in both Japan, where releases were reduced to a mere trickle by late 1988, and in the U.S., where new titles ceased to come out by 1990, right during the height of the NES's popularity. However, the Master System did take a life of its own elsewhere, in Europe, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand. The Master System continued to sell in those markets until the mid-90s, when many Mega Drive or Genesis games were ported to the Master System. Amazingly, official releases continued in Brazil until 1998, well until the PlayStation and Saturn era, thus giving the system a respectable lifespan of around 13 years. Altogether, the system sold around 15 million units, a fraction of what the NES sold, but more than the Saturn or Dreamcast, and enough to keep the system from being considered a complete failure. Sega launched the Mark III with two titles, Hang On and Teddy Boy Blues. But they did manage to get another seven titles out before the end of the year, all published by Sega themselves and all in the Sega card format. The Mark III had both a cartridge slot and a slot for the smaller, flat cards. These cards had also been used for the earlier SG-1000 games. The Sega cards could hold 256 kilobits, whereas by comparison, many Nintendo cartridges at this time held 320 or even 512 kilobits. Sega kicks off the Mark III, just like Nintendo did for the Famicom two years earlier, with a popular arcade title, in this case Hang On. Hang On was a Sega arcade hit released earlier in the year, and was noted for the fact that you played it sitting on a motorcycle that actually tilted back and forth. These kind of super deluxe arcade presentations were starting to be seen in the mid-1980s. Here's the arcade version, designed by Yu Suzuki. Hang On was clearly modeled after pole position, except with motorcycles instead of cars. The pseudo 3D technology was quite impressive at the time, and this sort of thing would go on to become sort of a specialty for Sega. Note what appear to be all the in-game advertisements for Shell and Bridgestone. And of course, the game featured very impressive fiery explosions when you crashed. Now here's the Mark III version. Obviously, it can't replicate the arcade graphics, but it's still very nice looking. As a point of comparison, let's look at Nintendo's Mock Rider, which was released around the same time. The Famicom really struggles with the 3D graphics, and the game is pretty choppy. Hang On is silky smooth next to Mock Rider, and it's much easier to play. The sprites are more detailed, and the colors much brighter. The Mark III was capable of displaying more colors in the Famicom. Now what about the game itself? Well, it's your pretty basic drive your vehicle around curves and don't hit anything kind of game. You need to complete each course in a set amount of time. Crashing your bike will not kill you, but it does waste valuable time. The collisions are not nearly as spectacular as the arcade versions, but they still look reasonably cool. The controls of Hang On are basic and effective. Perhaps the only complaint is that the animation of your bike when you lean is a little rough. Each area has sort of a different theme. Here we're in the seaside uh, level. Now we've moved on to Monument Valley. Certainly the environments are a lot more detailed and convincing than those in Mock Rider. So hang on to a rather simple game, but it's fun to play, and certainly demonstrates what the Mark III is capable of. A rather nice little music theme there. Here is the Mark III's other launch title, Teddy Boy Blues. A port of Sega's recent arcade title seen here. The console version is missing the nutty musical intro. Uh, we'll discuss that music in just a sec. 
Teddy Boy Blues is probably not that well remembered in the United States, but it must have been pretty popular in Japan. The music is rather catchy, and the title actually comes from a 1985 song by a Japanese singer named Yoko Ishino. That was Yoko you saw singing in the introduction to the arcade version a second ago. Apparently the song was popular enough to name a video game after it. Now what's a teddy boy, you wonder? Well, in the UK in the 1950s, teddy boys were sort of well-dressed rock and roll fans who usually sported elaborate hairstyles. They didn't get along with mods, apparently. Teddy, by the way, refers to the Edwardian period clothing they wore, velvet collars and whatnot. What does all this have to do with the game itself? Nothing, as far as I can tell. Teddy Boy Blues is a typical platformer of the mid-80s. You go around shooting enemies that then cause them to shrink down into little balls, which you must then collect. Enemies emerge out of boxes, uh, which all contain a certain number of enemies. You can tell how many are left by the number of dots on the side of the box. The game is well designed, but also a little bit frustrating in places. Only so many enemies will be out of the boxes at any one time. While this sounds helpful, it means that enemies pop out whenever you collect a ball. The balls often land on the boxes, making it dangerous to collect them. And on some levels, enemies have a tendency to land on you, since they jump out quite a ways when jumping off a platform. I routinely got hit by enemies, uh, thinking they'd be landing in front of me. Of course, as any game this vintage, there is a bonus round. You go around collecting various little items found in hidden boxes. Oddly, while Teddy Boy Blues and Hang On were both released on the Mark III's launch day, Teddy Boy is, I suppose, the official first release for the system, since it has a catalog number 501, whereas Hang On is 502. Though as far as demonstrating the Mark III's technical capabilities, it certainly seems to have taken a back seat. I guess this game must have been pretty popular in Japan in order for Sega to release it on the Mark III's launch day. Released just a week after launch, Great Soccer is Sega's first original game for the Mark III, assuming of course that you can consider something as basic as this sort of soccer game to be original. It was also the first in the Sega Sports series for the Mark III, all with the name uh, Great in the title. Obviously, this brings Nintendo to mind with their earliest releases for the Famicom all being either arcade ports or sports titles. I guess that's actually pretty standard for new consoles. Now what can we say about the game itself? Well, calling any game great, and I should point out the fact that this stadium has an advertisement for milk uh, behind the, um, the goalpost there, um, calling any game great uh, is sort of asking for trouble, especially with a quickie title like this. Sega does de deviate from Nintendo's soccer format, by having the field positioned vertically, not horizontally, so Great Soccer actually looks sort of like 10-yard fight. Rather than the realistically portioned guys from the Nintendo game, we have these uh, rather ugly little super deformed guys, all of which are cross-eyed. Now this game does have an easily visible red arrow that points to the player that you are currently controlling, and that's actually a rather nice touch. If you want to pass the ball, a white arrow will designate the player that the ball will go to. And naturally you can uh, kick the ball, pass it, the usual stuff. Uh, just like real soccer, the scores tend to be low, since it's much easier to have a goalkeeper catch the ball than it is to actually uh, make uh, a point. A scoring goal is pretty difficult. The graphics and sound are pretty unimpressive, and Great Soccer is certainly not a uh, we call a demonstration title for the Mark III. In other words, while Great Soccer is not bad for a very early release, it certainly doesn't look um, like a lot of time and effort went into it. Hell, maybe this was originally developed as an SG-1000 title. Sega themselves apparently didn't think too highly of Great Soccer, and they never released it in the US. Instead, they published another, better soccer game, World Soccer, and then released that in the US under the title of Great Soccer.
After taking a break for a couple months, Sega released a new title in mid-December, and just like Great Soccer, this is an original title for the Mark III. Fushigi no Ushiro Pit Pot. While Pit Pot isn't really spectacular, it is an interesting title in the way that it bears a superficial resemblance to Legend of Zelda, which would be released about two months after this. There's the top-down interior viewpoint, the four shortened walls and doors, the keys required to unlock the doors, all this appeared in Zelda. Though of course, none of these elements are really completely original, still it is an interesting coincidence. Pitpot has you controlling a very short knight that actually, uh, from the behind at least, bears an interesting resemblance to the prince from Katamari Damachi. You need to rescue a princess, but a rather strange one because your main objective is to collect the boxes of treasure scattered around the castle. Collecting all the treasure in a room will sometimes net you a key, but other times you'll have to perform some kind of special task in order to get the key. Now, despite being a knight, your weapon is not a sword, but rather a giant mallet, which you can use to crush enemies and knock out the great blocks. The gold blocks are anchored and can't be knocked out. You can cause a large section of the gray blocks to drop into the pit by knocking out all the blocks that are connected to the stationary gold blocks. However, in a lot of cases, this is difficult to do simply because there's a lot of blocks. There are, of course, various objects to pick up. Uh, their meanings are not always obvious. For example, the heart will freeze all enemies on the screen. Later games would tend to use something oh, that makes a bit more sense, like, say, a stopwatch for this. While Pit Pot is a cute little puzzlish sort of game, I get the impression this was knocked out pretty quickly by Sega. The graphics are very simple, and really this could have been done on the Famicom. I guess Pit Pot falls into the same general, general category as Bomberman, which was in fact released for the Famicom around the same time as this, I think maybe a week or two later. Unfortunately for Pit Pot, the Hudson title is actually a lot more fun to play. And Pit Pot suffers from a rather unfair ending. When you reach the princess, if you haven't collected every single treasure, the greedy bitch kills you. Game over. Definitely not the way to make gamers happy. So Pit Pot, interesting game, but really hardly superior to the sort of things that were being released on the Famicom at this time. Great Baseball, the second in Sega's earlier sports series, was released the day after Pit Pot. So it appears that Sega has embarked on a spree of putting out games for the 1985 holiday season. Of course, the same thing was happening with the Famicom, with Namco, Taito, Capcom, Irem, Bandai, Enix, Hudson, and others, all releasing games right before the year's end. The Famicom certainly had superiority in numbers, with 17 releases as compared to the Mark III's 6. As for Sega's Great Baseball, well, this is the Japanese game, actually a different game than the one that came out in the US under the name Great Baseball. Or rather, that game was a substantially re reworked version of this one, with completely different graphics. However, upon playing Great Baseball, you might realize that it could pass as a reworked version of Nintendo's Baseball, one of the very first games for the Famicom back in 1983. I guess uh, the very ideas behind a baseball video game hadn't really changed much since then. The gameplay and controls are pretty similar. Select one of the generic teams, then you have one of your generic players swing the bat. The CPU is pretty good at catching and fielding, though you will get lucky sometimes. The timing of the swings is a little different. The swing felt a little slow to me, but I didn't really play Great Baseball enough to get a good feel for it. Ah, uh, there's one of the times I just got lucky on that hit. Now while pitching, you have some basic options. Fastball or slow ball. And you can throw to the bases if the other team is trying to steal. While fielding, 
use the D-pad to select which base to throw to. It's all very similar to Nintendo's earlier game. Okay, now here my team is pitching. Except that unlike Nintendo's baseball, you can control your own outfielders while running to the ball. Like many team sports games, you control a group of players all at once. As you can see there, they're all moving in exact unison. What this means is it can be a little bit difficult to get your hands on the ball sometimes. If you think the ball is going to land between two players, if you move one towards the ball, you'll be moving another player away from the ball. Like a lot of these games, it's kind of difficult to know exactly where the ball is going to land, so this can occasionally cause you some trouble. And of course, the ball also tends to be hard to catch, often passing right between your legs. On the positive side, it seems the ball can kill an umpire. That guy doesn't seem to be getting up. So as a rule, like these baseball games, fielding is the most difficult part. Now one more complaint. Not only do your outfielders move very slowly, as they, they tend to do, but they throw very slowly. The ball actually moves at about the same speed as the runner. Obviously this doesn't make real sense, um, and most baseball games tend to have the ball move much faster than the guy you're running. But in a case like that, when you're trying to, uh, you are throwing the ball and the guy is running in the same direction, there's no way you're going to get him out. So as I said, I didn't really play great baseball enough to master the controls, but it seems to me that calling it maybe good baseball or perhaps even average baseball might be a bit more accurate. It really just is Nintendo's baseball with a slightly uh, better graphics. Everyone likes shoot 'em ups, right? Scrolling shooter games must have been quite popular in Japan at this time. There certainly were enough of them released for the Famicom. So naturally, Sega chose to release not one, but two shoot 'em ups in a row for the Mark III. The boringly titled Satellite 7 is the first and lesser of the two. Right off the bat, here's a problem. If you die while a wave of enemies is on the screen, you can respawn right in the middle of that wave, with enemies right on top of you. Now, the situation captured on video here isn't really that dire, but there have been times when I have died and respawned right on top of an enemy, thus getting the dreaded double death, and I've even encountered the triple death on occasion. And of course, in shoot 'em ups, this is really considered to be not fair. In general, though, Satellite 7 is just not a very good shooter. Your ship or tank or whatever it is moves sluggishly, and the game lacks much variety. There are little power-ups here, uh, which are gotten by collecting the stars, get enough of a certain color, and you'll get a power-up. Green, for example, makes you temporarily invincible. I'm not sure what the other stars do I ever actually got around to collecting another color. Um, one thing, though, in general we don't like on shoot ups is temporary power-ups. I somehow can't imagine that the other power-ups are very spectacular, however. Satellite 7 is clearly modeled after Namco Xevious, and like many of the post-Xevious pre-Gradius shooters, it isn't really a lot of fun. The big black borders and excessively large sidebar certainly don't help much. It really gives the game a feeling of like one of those old computer shoot 'em ups You also have bombs, but they don't have a very big blast range, and you need to basically be an exact hit when you use them. The first boss is kind of weird. He actually has a counter on him that tells me how many more hits you need to kill him. Unfortunately, once you get rid of him, he doesn't actually explode or do anything cool like that. He just sort of slinks away. Ah, yeah, there we go. That's all there is. Kind of a shame, really. So, while this game has colorful graphics, which are pretty typical of the Mark III, Nothing in the game, the uh, background, enemies, weapons, anything, has any sort of character. I'm not even really sure if your vehicle is ground-based or air-based. I'm going to have to call Satellite 7 a disappointment, even by 1985 standards, it was way behind the times.
I promised you two shooters in a row, and here's number two. Astro Flash, known as Transbot in the US, and for some reason, Nuclear Creatures in Brazil. Released a mere two days after Satellite 7, it is certainly the better title of the two. Your first impression will probably be, wow, this game looks really nice, much better than the boring and ugly Satellite 7. And check out that really awesome parallax scrolling. I could be mistaken, but I don't think we've really seen this impressive a use of parallax in a console game before. It really gives the feeling of speed and depth missing in earlier shoot-em-ups for home systems. And additionally, Astro Flash even has power-ups. Shooting the little, little uh, delivery van there will cause a power orb to fall out, grabbing the orb, and hitting your second button will select a power-up. Now, you can't exactly choose your power-ups. It cycles through the available power-ups very, very quickly, and will stop whenever you hit the button. So a certain amount of luck is involved. Unfortunately, the power-ups are all temporary, and will run out of time when the arm meter goes all the way to the left. Also, you can take multiple hits, and will only lose a life when the power meter runs out. Among the five power-ups available are a couple that will turn you into a robot, as we've already seen. Viewers of Crontendo will know this is already a bit of a video game cliché, with several Famicom titles uh, featuring robot to, uh, and ship transformations, starting with uh, Formation Z all the way back in early 1985. Now those power orb vans arrive pretty frequently, so you really won't go too long, if at all, without a power-up. And here we've reached the second area, which is a more, you know, futuristic type city, again with pretty nice scrolling. So even though this game seems like a vast improvement over Satellite 7, it's still far from perfect. It's, it's not exactly sidearms. The levels and enemies are pretty repetitive, and literally so. This level will loop infinitely until you destroy one particular enemy. Unfortunately, this enemy can only be destroyed by one particular weapon, the missiles. So if you don't have the missiles and you encounter it, you'll have to repeat the entire level and try again. Obviously, this game will piss you off quite a bit until you figure it out. Oh, here's one of the coolest power-ups right here. Strangely, the Japanese release has a catalog number of 503, making it sequentially the third Mark III game. However, it was released after numbers 504 and through 407, so Mark III games weren't always released in numerical order. It was given a US release in 1986, unlike Satellite 7, but under the name Transbot, with a Transformer-like robot on the cover, obviously an attempt to cash in on the popular toy line. And as a weird coda to all this, in 1986, Sega released an arcade version of Astro Flash, this time known in the US as simply Transformer. For the arcade version, the whole uh, shooting the supply ships has been eliminated, and you can simply transform back and forth between a jet and a robot at will, thus giving it a Formation Z-like quality. Unfortunately, the arcade game isn't really that much better than the console version, as far as I can tell. As we approach the end of 1985, we have another shooter of sorts, F-16 Fighting Falcon. Note the name Nexa in the credits. This was released in Europe as F-16 Fighter. You can choose the difficulty level right off the bat by the number of enemy fighters. Once the game starts, you might be surprised by the rather unimpressive graphics. This definitely looks a few generations older than the Mark III. This definitely has the most limited color palette we've seen for the System 3. Uh, black, white, two shades of blue, green, red, and yellow. If this doesn't look like the typical Sega game, well, it's not. This is actually the first Mark III release not developed by Sega. Oops, I just got myself blown up immediately there. I scored zero points. This game was developed by Nexa, though Sega presumably ported the game. F-16 Fighter is the port of a 1984 MSX Jet Fighter simulation game. This version looks almost exactly like the MSX version. Nexa was an American company uh, that released a few games in the mid-80s and was founded by the noted Silicon Valley personality Gilman Louie, a fellow who is, quite frankly, more interesting than this game. 
As you saw there, I just blew up one of the enemy fighters with my missiles. You have two forms of weapons here. Missiles or the 20mm machine gun. As you can see by the little readout there on the left-hand side, I currently have the gun selected. Louis seemed to specialize in F-16 simulation games and uh, actually ran a few different video game companies, including one called Spectrum Holobyte. While with them, Louis secured the U.S. rights for an obscure Russian video game called Tetris. I assume he made some money off of that. He's nowadays more known as a financier and actually does investment work for the CIA. As for F-16 Fighting Falcon, well, like a lot of aircraft simulation games, it has an overly complicated display and controls. In fact, you actually have to use two game controllers. The D-pad on the one controls your speed, and the D-pad on the other controls your direction, and then the buttons do various things. The main challenge of this game is to sort of master the uh, complicated controls and figure out how to actually use them to shoot things down. I'm trying to right now uh, speed up and catch that guy right there. I suppose that aircraft freaks might enjoy this sort of thing, but probably everybody else will find it a little bit boring. For some reason I just can't seem to lock on. There we go. Um, the fact that Nexa was the first third-party developed game for the Mark III indicates what a major lock Nintendo had on the video game developers and how far afield Sega had to go in order to find companies willing to work with them. Astro Flash, F6 Fighting Falcon, and this game, Great Tennis, were all released on December 22nd, and this will conclude 1985 for the Mark III. So far, Sega seems to be taking the same path as Nintendo did when it released the Famicom in 1983. A few arcade ports, some sports games, a few original titles. I earlier remarked on the similarity of Great Baseball to Nintendo's early baseball game, and the same holds true for Great Tennis. It's really just Nintendo's tennis with brighter colors. Now there seems to be some confusion over the name. The box says Great Tennis, and the screen says Super Tennis. In the US and Europe, this game was released later as Super Tennis. Just like the old Nintendo tennis game, it doesn't really advance on the gameplay of the old Atari 2600 tennis game. Run up to the ball and press the button to swing the racket. I didn't really care for the Nintendo game, and I don't really like this one either. Mostly due to the controls seeming just a little off. First of all, serving can be difficult. The ball frequently either hits the net or lands just past the service line. I've actually lost entire games strictly through hitting too many faults. However, once you get the ball in play, great tennis doesn't really seem that bad. Even though the hit detection sometimes is a little wrong, at times the game seems very generous. As you hit balls that seem outside your racket's range, other times the ball seems to pass right through your racket. One thing that's a little bit of a concern while playing this game is your opponent there, uh, what exactly is he wearing? While you seem to be having your sort of standard tennis shorts, he seems to be wearing some kind of bikini brief bottoms. Like a lot of early Mark III titles, Sega seems to have sort of phoned this one in. Nintendo's tennis seemed pretty impressive in 1983, but by late 1985, a game like this would seem a little behind the times. Sega may be suffering from the same problem that Nintendo had in the early days of the Famicom. They had to develop every single title themselves. Fortunately for Nintendo, they quickly picked up a lot of third-party developers and publishers for the Famicom. Sega would not be so lucky. So 1985 hasn't really been that successful for the Mark III. The only really game I can recommend without any reservations is Hang On. Astro Flash is not that bad. Uh, the other games all seem, well, Pit Pot, I guess, has its moments. But for the most part, not a lot of great games for the Mark III. Hopefully, 1986 will see better luck. In 1986, the Mark III's first full year, a mere 16 titles were released in Japan. Again, all published by Sega, due mostly to Nintendo's uh, having pretty much every major Japanese publisher and developer in their corner. 
Still, Sega did take a step forward by ditching the Sega card format and releasing games in the cartridge format, most of which held 1 megabit at this time. And in June, Sega released the Sega Master System in the US, though we'll discuss that more next time. Nineteen eighty six kicks off slowly, but it does with another arcade port. This time it's Station Scandal or Youth Scandal. This is sort of very early beat 'em up, rather curious little title. It was originally a nineteen eighty five arcade game in which you travel across town to rescue your girlfriend who is kidnapped by some thugs. In the US it was known as My Hero. Here's the arcade version here. Pretty much the same plot as pretty much well every beat 'em up going back to Spartan X Kung Fu Master. The arcade game was released by Sega, but developed by a company called Corlin. Corlin was later bought out by Bandai in the late 1980s, and their name was changed to Banpresto. Nowadays, they do a lot of games based on licensed properties. Here we are back to the Mark III version. While the arcade game was a decent little time waster, the Mark III port, presumably ported by Sega themselves, is a whole other story. While it superficially looks very similar, it plays very differently. As you may have noticed from the gameplay uh, video here, it is impossibly difficult and you will keep dying. There are often a lot of enemies on the screen at once. In the arcade game, you can just tear right through them quite easily with your punches or kicks, quite similar to Kung Fu Master. In the home version, there seems to be some sort of like little lag whenever you attack, and it requires much more precision. You'll frequently find yourselves being hit by the enemies before you can hit them. As a result, Station Scandal, well, we just saw it right there. I walked up to the guy and bam, he just knocked me out. The game really is a, a bit of a drag, and uh, even playing through... <laughs> See, there's another cheap death right there. Right as I walked up to the guy and hit him, he threw a little mine up in the air that hit me and killed me. That's really hardly fair. Well, the arcade version actually has three different levels. There's a second one, the third one have like a historical theme and like a science fiction theme. The Mark III version just, again, the platforming is a little strange. It looks like I sort of jumped right through uh, that little platform there. In the US, this was released as uh, My Hero. Unfortunately, they changed the title screen, but nothing else. It doesn't actually play any better than the Mark III version. And as I was mentioning, the uh, the home version only has one level, basically this sort of repeats over and over again. So, unfortunately, My Hero, uh, it's nice to see Sega doing another arcade port, this game is pretty unplayable. Next up is a Sega developed original title for the Mark III, Machine Gun Joe, or Comical Machine Gun Joe as it is sometimes called. Video game publishers seem to take a little break after the busy holiday season, at least in terms of the release schedule. Sega's no exception, Machine Gun Joe came out over four and a half months into the year. Machine Gun Joe is not a bad title, very simple, but an improvement over Station Scandal. You play this cute little gangster guy that everyone wants to kill. Just as uh, Station Scandal predated games like Renegade and Double Dragon, Machine Gun Joe predated Cabal by two years. Your character moves left and right along the bottom of the screen, shooting enemies in the background. Though if you think about it, this style of game is really just an updated variation on Space Invaders. Joe can fire in five directions, straight up, left, and right, as well as at a 45 degree angle. At the end of every level you encounter one of these fast-moving bosses. He's either this guy in red or a Japanese schoolgirl. You do have a power-up in the form of a red hat that allows you to shoot faster. There are pigs that will drop bombs, which can clear the screen of enemies. And like a couple other Sega games, Teddy Boy Blues and Station Scandal the Arcade version, enemies don't die, but rather shrink down into little versions of themselves. These little enemies are not completely harmless. They can attach themselves to your sides and slow you down. As you may have noticed, there is a pretty healthy dose of nonsense in Machine Gun Joe. I guess that's why the guy in the game is called Comical Machine Gun Joe. Aside from oddball enemies like pigs and spiders, the levels have a, um, get a little weird as the game progresses. 
The harbor seems like a natural enough place for gangsters to hang out, but eventually we move on to this graveyard and then to a fairy tale like forest setting. So, Machine Gun Joe is an example of the Japanese humor game aesthetic uh, that sort of mixes inappropriate objects together in weird, random ways. Other examples would be Twin B or the Parodius series. Either way, it's certainly nice to see Sega come up with something a little different and unusual for the Mark III. Next up is another Mark III original, the unimaginatively titled Ghost House. As you might guess, it's a horror-themed game in which you traipse your way through a monster-filled mansion with the intent to find and kill Dracula. If that sounds like some other, better game from Konami, well, the idea is similar, but the execution couldn't be more different. Ghost House did come out a few months before Castlevania, so it gets points for being first at least, but certainly not better. Ghost House is uh, more of an old-school platformer, kind of reminds me of Mappy or games of that ilk, but with some newer gaming elements added in. For example, you can punch monsters as they approach you, or you can kill them by jumping on them. You have a life bar, not too common at this time, health refill items, a weapon upgrade, and a few other tricks. Despite all this, the game does feel decidedly old-fashioned. The object is simply to survive long enough to find Dracula's casket. Um, or rather, to find the real Dracula, as he apparently employs Dracula lookalikes as decoys. Once you've killed all the vampires, you move on to stage 2 and so on. Here is one of the caskets right here, and Dracula has emerged. He's that rather large bat floating around. Anytime you touch a casket, he'll rise out and attack you. He spends most of his time in bat form, but occasionally uh, goes down to uh, human form or vampire form, as you see there. Hitting him enough times will kill him, but usually you take some damage yourself upon making contact. Now at last I understand how smart Simon Belmont was to uh, take that whip in with him. There's various other monsters in the mansion, uh, including, well, let's see, uh, blue ghosts, lots and lots of bats, fire-breathing trolls of some sort, um, all of which are pretty annoying and uh, can be kind of a pain to kill. However, you do have a uh, rather nice, though highly unlogical trick that you can use. Jumping up and hitting a light bulb will, uh, with your head will cause all the monsters to freeze for a few moments. Oh yes, and there's the uh, key you need to actually open up the caskets. Here comes another one. As I mentioned, uh, hitting the light bulb will cause everyone to freeze. You can then walk up to the stationary Dracula and pretty much uh, hit him to his heart's, uh, your heart's content and uh, hopefully kill him without taking very much damage. So, uh, Ghost House is full of weird little nonsensical things, uh, such as uh, jumping in front of one of the candle holders will cause someone to throw a knife at you. Uh, but if you jump and land on the knife, you can then use it as a weapon. Just like a real knife, you can only stab someone with it a few times before it simply disappears. Oh yes, and you can only use the light bulb trick a few times each level before it stops working. So, Ghost House is a reasonably well presented game and can be fun at times. Oh, as you can see here, the, uh, when he's in his bat form, he can be rather difficult to kill, as he keeps whacking you over and over again. Now, one thing I don't like about the game is the fact that even though you can jump, you can't really seem to jump over much. The bats move up and down while flying, kind of like the Medusa heads in Castlevania, so my first instinct is to try to jump over them, but this generally does not work, and you do get hit frequently in this game. It's more or less unavoidable. Luckily, your health decreases pretty slowly and their health refills all over. Still, getting hit in this game kind of pisses me off. So I guess Ghost House is at the halfway point between Mappy and Castlevania. I never thought I'd be saying that about a game, but here it is.
So far, 1987 hasn't been too impressive for the Mark III, but all that's about to change with this release, the fun, frantic cute em up Fantasy Zone. Fantasy Zone is a port of Sega's arcade game, which was relatively new at this time. It actually hit arcades in March. The Mark III version was released in June. In Fantasy Zone, your ship is Opa Opa. You must destroy a series of enemy spawning bases using your twin laser beams or bombs. The premise is really not that far off from Teddy Boy Blues. Here's the arcade version here. It has fantastic presentation, awesome music, multi-layered backgrounds, huge bosses, really everything you could want in a shoot 'em up of this era. The Mark III version has obviously been graphically downgraded. The limited uh, vertical scrolling found, as you can see here, in the original version has been eliminated. Here's the first boss from the arcade version. Again, fantastic music. One thing about Fantasy Zone is that it lets you buy items from shops. You collect gold coins throughout the game and can then buy various upgrades to your engines, which will make you faster, various sorts of weapons, more powerful bombs, even extra lives, which obviously come in quite handy, as the game is uh, quite difficult. Now, Fantasy Zone somehow managed to get away with breaking a lot of the cardinal rules of shoot 'em ups. For example, the weapons are all temporary. As you can see, my wide beam just ran out there. They only last about 15 seconds. Of course, most of them are so powerful that they would sort of break the game if you could use them until you die. Odd that uh, Fantasy Zone came out. Uh, here's the seven-way shot, far and away the most powerful uh, laser in the game. It's interesting that this game came out right around the same time, uh, at least in the arcade version, as Legend of Zelda, and both sort of featured the ability to buy items in shops. Sort of an RPG-style idea that uh, became increasingly popular as time went by. Now, prior to this game, all of the Mark III games had been released in the Sega My Card format. Fantasy Zone is the first cartridge for the system. The carts can hold more than the My Cards. Fantasy Zone was one megabit, uh, pretty impressive in those days. Sega would release a couple more of the My Cards after this, but they were phased out pretty quickly. As I was mentioning, this game is not quite as impressive looking as the arcade version, but it certainly has the very wonderful bright colors of Fantasy Zone. One thing that was changed is the bosses now all have separate screens. You don't fight them on the main level. This guy here, you have to uh, shoot the little three orbiting planets out through the spaces in the outer ring of planets there. Uh, all these bosses don't look that difficult. They seem like the idea of uh, killing them is pretty simple, but the thing is, they all have time limits. If you don't kill them quickly enough, they will start moving around the screen towards you and uh, kill you actually pretty quickly, so you're sort of frantically trying to uh, get these guys as quickly as possible. Using power-ups during the boss fights can be helpful. Now one thing about Fantasy Zone, it looks cute, but it is tough. It can be very tough at times. Enemies will often materialize out of nowhere. Like these guys, which are incredibly annoying, they actually uh, try to close in on you as you move left and right, and they follow you, so you have to quickly dash between them. I've probably lost more lives to those little orange things than any other enemy in the game. In fact, enemies following you around and trying to ram your ship are actually pretty common. Like I said this game breaks a lot of shoot 'em up rules, but somehow manages to get away with it. Even though the game is hard, it doesn't really seem cheap. Despite the fact that enemies will occasionally follow you around, speed up, and then ram you while your back is turned. So in conclusion, Fantasy Zone is pretty awesome. Definitely the best game of the Mark III so far, and probably the best shoot 'em up on a home console system so far. Despite many shoot 'em ups being uh, released for the Famicom, uh, they were not very good. Twin B maybe, maybe being the best so far. Definitely an early high water mark for the system. Nineteen eighty six is halfway over, and there really haven't been many Mark III games released yet. We're almost ready to wrap up this episode, but first here's Mark III's wrestling game, Goku Aku Dome Dump Matsumoto, released in the US under the more generic title of Pro Wrestling. Unlike most other wrestling games, Goku Aku Dome is a female wrestling game, ladies wrestling being quite popular in Japan at this time. It's also a port of this Sega arcade game called just Dump Matsumoto, or Body Slam, in the US. 
This was, just like Fantasy Zone, a new game. I wonder if Sega wasn't developing arcade games and their Mark III ports in tandem at this point. The arcade version has the typical nice Sega System 16 graphics and pretty cool music. So you may be wondering, what is Dump Matsumoto? Well, she's a real-life Japanese wrestler, and Goku Akudome was her wrestling team. I could be wrong, but I think the Fresh Gals were based on rival team slash pop singers, the Crush Gals. While US female wrestlers tend to be somewhat glamorous, in Japan they often go the opposite route, with crazy hair and makeup giving them an almost demonic look. Obviously this Mark III version has taken a pretty big graphical hit, as well as a stylistic makeover. The more realistically proportioned figures are now your uh, typical super deformed style characters. Your wrestler can throw punches and kicks, and has a few special moves performed, while the opponent is either down or flying off the ropes. There is no grappling in this game, something that would become standard in most wrestling games later, such as Nintendo's Pro Wrestling, which was released about three months after this. Still, Gokuaku Dome is pretty advanced for its time. Consider that its predecessors on consoles were the really, really super awful uh, Kaniku Man and Technos' Tag Team Wrestling. You can even occasionally find a chair to use as a weapon. Now, in the United States, uh, this game was released under the name Pro Wrestling, with the wrestlers being changed to more generic style male wrestlers. I guess really scary looking female wrestlers wouldn't fly with Western gamers, or just really wouldn't make any sense to them, them having nothing to connect it with. This nice little intro has been added of the wrestlers jumping into the ring, but the game itself pretty much plays the same. Either way, this game can be difficult and a little unfair. Uh, first of all, you have to play a lot of rounds to win the championship. And the CPU almost seems to always have the upper hand. Your punches and kicks often miss, while the CPU seems to be able to get a lot more hits in. Their special moves can also be performed much more quickly. So while this is an interesting uh, entry from Sega, I, I wouldn't really consider it to be a classic, and there certainly would be better wrestling games. Whoa-ho! That's a rather dramatic little intro there. Our last game in the first episode of Cron Sega is Hakodo no Ken, which was based on the popular comic, TV series, movie, etc., known as Fist of the North Star in the West. The plotline is somewhat complicated. It involves this guy, Kenshiro, who lives in a post-apocalyptic world and can hit guys so hard they explode. How? By hitting them on their pressure points. Japan was apparently in the midst of a Hokuto no Ken blitz because about two weeks later this game came out, Hokuto no Ken by Shoei System for the Famicom, one of the all-time worst Famicom games. Normally the name Hokuto no Ken strikes terror in the hearts of sensitive video gamers, but the Sega game really isn't that bad by comparison. Of course, being better than the Famicom, Hokuto no Ken is sort of like being taller than a midget. It's really not saying much. This game is your standard early beat-em-up, walk right and kill guys. Not really that much different than Kung Fu Master. You have a punch, a kick, a leg sweep, a low punch, and if you kick while jumping, a flying kick. Every so often you face a sub-boss, and at the end of each level, a main boss. All this adds up to a game that is decent, if repetitive, but there are at least some variation in the boss fights. If nothing else, Sega could create a decent boss fight, as proven by earlier games like Fantasy Zone, which had really rad bosses. Compared to the Famicom game, these guys don't explode quite as entertainingly. They just sort of fly into various pieces. Alright, here's the first boss. Apparently all this follows the plot of a comic book. In a nice touch, the boss fights take place in their own little areas, and they actually have bigger sprites. Sort of like Konami's soon-to-be-released Castlevania, each boss has a pattern, and you must find his weakness and exploit it. Simply attacking modestly won't work. Once you drain the boss's life bar, you then proceed to whip the shit out of them, 
but he doesn't explode for some reason. Then it's on to the next level, with uh, slightly more difficult enemies, and so on. And here we go. These guys jump occasionally, as opposed to just walking forward. Though doesn't Hakuna no Ken take place in Japan, what's with all the Old West-style saloon doors on the buildings? Now in the US, where Fist of North Star wasn't really very popular yet, Sega pulled a Bandai and released the game's sans licensed characters as Black Belt. The gameplay is the same, but the sprites and backgrounds have all been changed to more generic kung fu dudes and uh, Chinese settings. And of course, the high quality of somewhat ridiculous artwork on the Japanese version has been replaced by one of the most notorious examples of bad video game cover art. You're wondering why the Master System didn't sell over here? Well, seriously, looking at that cover art, would you buy the game? One change is now there are little sort of power-ups or health refills that float by occasionally. You have to execute a special jump to get them, and it seems like they always appear when you're surrounded by enemies. The bosses have all been changed, from Hokuto Ken characters to the uh, more generic karate dudes, but they mostly behave the same. As you'll see on the first boss, they sort of changed his hairstyle. So Hokuto no Ken, a decent arcade style game, but Sega, this is 1986. Games are changing. You need to get with the times. Well, there you have it. That was the first 10 months of the Mark III. While the Sega system was a technically impressive console, software-wise it was still in its infancy. The Mark III was not particularly successful in Japan, where by late 1985 the Famicom dominated the market. What Sega lacked was, in modern terms, a killer app. Nintendo certainly had this with Super Mario Bros., Sega was, ironically, the more experienced video game producer, but yet hadn't been able to make a really good console game. To see how different and innovative the Famicom was, think of the original games released during this same time period. Super Mario Bros., Portopia, Legend of Zelda, Mighty Bomb Jack, Dragon Quest, not to mention the many ports of such games as Makaimura and Gradius. Additionally, Sega had a rather relaxed release schedule. Six games in the first seven months of 1986, as opposed to almost 40 games for the Famicom? No wonder no one bought the Mark III. Sega had quite a ways to go before it could catch up to Nintendo. Hopefully we'll see some improvement in Cron Sega Episode 2.